Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real uh, pleasure to welcome you to this year's Festival of Excellence. Sitting here watching this video, um, I really there were two impressions that I was feeling. Uh, one was how quickly time goes. Um, just a year ago, we were right here doing this very thing um, with th in a much bigger audience. This is really terrific that this just gets bigger. But it reminded me of a quote by Karen Hope that said, this time next year, you will wish you have begun. Which reminds us that often those real intentions that we have to start today, we need to start today. Because time goes so quickly. So that was one, how, is, is this impression of how quickly time goes. The other was how, well, oh, the sense of gratitude I have about being a part of this university and how lucky we are as a collective to experience this thing together. My name is Brad Cook and I'm the provost here. And uh, this is actually a very special opportunity to, to, to just introduce you, well, we introduce our, our next guest and also welcome you because this will be the last festival of excellence that I'm a part of. And one of the, the things that I'm very gratified about in my time at SUU was this particular convening that started out quite small and has continued to grow and evolve and really exhibit some of the very best thinking and projects and arguments that we have on this campus. It's really an opportunity for us to celebrate the work of each other. That's what it started out as. That often when we are thinking about, you know, um, opportunities for faculty and students to present their creative work, their scholarly work, their research, it's usually, we, all, we, we mostly thought about how we would get those students and faculty opportunities to share their work outside of the university. And a group of us felt that it was, that's, that's terrific, but it's a shame that the incredible intellectual and creative talent that might be rec right next door to us is something that we may not even know about. And so we really felt that we need to sort of appreciate, stop and pause, um, and understand the beauty that's right here at our feet. I want to just share with one story with you and then we're going to get on with the program, but I think it's relevant here and I think it's, uh, it encapsulates um, really a larger metaphor of what education is all about. A couple of years ago, two very gifted biology faculty invited me out to a location, a site near Kanab, where they had received a grant to do some work um, on collecting seeds. So you may or may not know that um, the country actually has these seed banks that in the case of, a, of, a, of, a, of an event, a catastrophic event, that might wipe out certain segments of our plant life, that there is a bank in which these seeds are kept and stored that can repopulate in the event that something happens. Well, they wanted me to come and look at their project and to um, see what some of the students were doing. But I gotta tell you, it was, at the time I felt, uh, it was just a really bad time. It was hot, it was in the summer. There had something happened that day and I was just grumpy. And I just, I just had, and it was two hours away and I ended up taking the wrong route. I was an hour and a half late, all this sort of stuff. I finally get there, apologize profusely, and these two gifted educators got me at, we, we, we got out of the car, and we're standing in what looks to me like a barren wasteland of sagebrush. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I came all the way out here to this. But, you know, um, I, I sort of did listen to these faculty, as we left and walked from the car, maybe even 10, 20 feet into the sagebrush, where the idea was that we were gonna try and make our way to these red cliffs, probably about a half a mile. But we never got there, because we got about 50 feet or so, 20, 30 feet into this sagebrush, when these educators, these 
passionate uh, teachers started to point out things that I had not even noticed. They would point out, even within a very short circumference, the incredible amount of variety of plant life within, say, 10 or 20 feet. And then we started to look a little closer about the insect life and then about the soils. And this went on for an hour, and I was, it was contagious, their enthusiasm for their field and their knowledge was contagious to me. Driving back, I reflected on this experience and it occurred to me that there was a much more momentous and transformative experience that happened to me that day. Had we just had this goal of just getting to the Red Cliffs and walking through this this patch of ground, I would have missed the very beauty and the complexity of what was under our feet. I will never look at that piece of ground or a piece of ground like that in the same way. I can't not see it differently. That it's not just a piece of ground with sagebrush. It's just not sort of a barren place. In fact, it is an ecosystem of complicated and complex life form. And it occurred to me that this is what education is about. And it's really what the Festival of Excellence is about. That that it's an exercise in consciousness expansion. Education is about expanding our current lens to something clearer so that we see the world in all of its vibrancy, in all of its color, in all of its complexity. We are better people for it. We're more informed. And we're, and our lives will be better for it. So what I encourage you today, but what I also encourage you in your life, is to not just, sometimes we're just so goal-driven that we miss the very reason we're here. That if we're just out for our degree, or just out for a certificate, or just out for our grade, sometimes you've missed the whole point. If we had gone just to the Red Cliffs, which would have been fine, it would have been a fine walk, but we would have, I would have missed a very transformative experience. I challenge you today that as you sit and participate or present or be a part of this, that you are present with the information that's being presented and let the scales fall off your eyes so that tomorrow you see the world in greater detail and more beauty. Thank you. I want to recognize some really important organizers of this event. Uh, Dr. Scott Knowles, Jacob Ward, um, Lynn Vartan. These, there are many more that to pull something like this off takes a whole team. But the amount of, of work that goes into something like this, um, you can't imagine. And I thank you for taking this from what we started out as a small idea to something that's bigger and I just hope this, this goes into the future with that much more power. Scott. Ooh, there's so many of you. So I'm Dr. Scott Knowles. I'm co-director of the Festival of Excellence with Jacob Ward. Uh, and I wanted to just take a few minutes because as Brad Cook uh, just noted, there's actually a tremendous amount of work that goes into the Festival of Excellence. Uh, all the faculty and staff mentors, thank you so much for helping our students produce the great work that we're seeing today. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to uh, let you know who the committee members are who really help make this event a possibility each and every year. Uh, so first up, we have Ashley Arsenal. We have Sherry Butler. Butler, Patrick Clark, Billy Klaus, Laura June Davis, Kaylee Gerlach, Kelly Goonan, Casey Hoffines, Jennifer Hunter, Michael Croft, Hannah Lake, Kenzie Lundberg, Chris Monson, Mary Page, Emily Ronquillo, Ali Sapush, 
Amy Uckman, Lynn Vartan, and Trudy Woodup. And this doesn't even count all the volunteers that you've been seeing today at each and every one of your rooms and at all the information desks and all the Chartwell's employees helping to keep us fed and happy as we learn today. So please join me in thanking all of these wonderful people for everything they've done. Next up, I, I want to bring up Kelly Goonan to the stage. Uh, Kelly was the chair of our awards committee for the Festival of Excellence this year, and she is going to uh, present our Festival of Excellence 2019 award winners. Kelly. Thank you, Scott. Um, I do quickly want to recognize my co-committee members, uh, Dr. Laura June Davis from History and Dr. Chris Monson from Chemistry. Um, I think we have the best job on the committee because we get to read all the wonderful things that faculty and staff mentors say about their students, all the great things that students say about their mentors, um, and we're really excited to be able to recognize everyone today. I'm going to start with the student award winners. Students, if you're here, when I announce your name, if you could come up and line up in front of the stage. Um, I'd ask those of you in the audience if we can hold our applause until everyone is up here. Um, and then I will follow with the mentors and then a new special award that we have this year. So the student project award winners this year, Billy Klaus, Monica Lee, Kaylee Prunty, Dustin Pullman, Evan Miller, Mariah Clayson, Nicholas Bastian, Zulma Alvarez, Mary Glenn, Tyler Haroldson, Michaela Heaton, Tori Sageman, Haley Ekman, Riley Miller, Laura Ashton, Garrett Roosh, and Andrew Lloyd. And if we could have a round of applause for our student distinguished. And you can find all of these wonderful students and their presentations um, in your program. They're listed under the Distinguished Student Project Award uh, category on the SCED app. So please go see all the wonderful things that these students are doing. Um, thank you guys. We have certificates for you that we'll give to you at lunch so you can show them off to everyone afterwards. So thank you. You guys can sit down. <laughs> As Scott mentioned, none of this would be possible without our faculty mentors. And so faculty, if you are here, also please come up to the stage so that we can recognize you. Um, we have Clint Broadbent from Family Life and Human Development, Grant Corser from Psychology, Michael Crotty from the Department of Theater, Arts, and Dance, Emily Dean from History, Sociology, and Anthropology, Jacob Dean from Physical Science, Lance Forshee from Biology, David Maxwell from Physical Science, and Laura Quaresimo from Theater Arts and Dance. Um, thank you all for everything that you do to help support our students and make this event what it is. Um, the, we'll have to send you the comments that we got because they're, I promise they'll make you feel better during this end of semester rush. Um, you're all doing great things and we really appreciate it, so thank you. And then the last award we have to give, this is a new award for 2019. Um, as I mentioned, these awards are given out based on feedback um, from the student mentors and the students. Again, it's really wonderful when we're busy to sit down and just read all of the wonderful things that people are doing, um, how much the students appreciate the mentorship that they're given, um, the great work that the students are getting or doing and um, how the faculty see. And one thing that we noticed when we were going through the student comments for the mentor awards was how many amazing comments there were for a number of different faculty and staff in a particular department. And so we asked the committee if we could develop a new distinguished departmental mentorship award 
that recognizes the work going on in a single department, because um, it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate to have all of our distinguished mentors um, from the same department. We really want to um, recognize all of the work going throughout campus. Um, Scott said yes. I am presenting this award because it's actually for his department. Um, he had nothing to do with this other than saying yes, we could give the award before we told him who it was going to. So if members of the Department of Theater and Arts could please come up, we've got a nice plaque for you to recognize all of the wonderful mentorship that you all have given to your students this year um, and to recognize your and your students' uh, participation in Festival of Excellence. So we really appreciate everything that you guys are doing for campus and our students. Thank you, everyone. Hello, my name is Ravi Roy, and I'm with the Political Science and Criminal Justice Department. And I've been given the privilege to introduce our speaker today, our keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Zak, who's going to be speaking to us on building high trust in high performance organizations. And before I introduce uh, Dr. Zach, I'd first of all like to thank uh, President Scott Wyatt, Dr. Bradley Cook, Dean Jean Barine, uh, Lynn Vartan, and uh, all of her staff that um, really deserve, I mean, always does a great job with these things. And also, since it is political science and criminal justice is the initiator of the invitation to Dr. Zach, I would also like to thank uh, Colonel uh, Kevin Jacobson as well. Um, I've known uh, Dr. Zach for, we were uh, joking uh, earlier yesterday on the flight over that we've known each other about a quarter of a century now. <laughs> um, so it's really gratifying for me to be able to uh, introduce him. And uh, Dr. Zach uh, has a very eclectic background in that he is, his appointment is actually with the Department of School, uh, the School with Politics and Economics the School of Management, and the School of Psychology at Claremont Graduate University, which is also my alma mater. So how fitting it is on this Festival of Excellence, which celebrates uh, diversity and eclecticism and Renaissance thinking and education, um, not least of which promoted by our esteemed provost, who, whose own career is a testimony to those things, that we should invite uh, Dr. Zach um, at Dr. Cook's uh, final Festival of Excellence. So thank you, Brad, also, for all of you. So uh, as I said, uh, Professor uh, Zach has a, is a professor of economics, psychology, and management at Claremont Graduate University. Uh, he has a PhD in economics uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and has held a postdoc training in neuroimaging from Harvard University. Uh, prior to that, he was a bachelor's degree is at San Diego State University, which he double majored in both mathematics and economics. And um, while it's not on here, I happen to know you were also valedictorian, Paul. Um, so uh, his latest book, uh, The Trust Factor, um, The Science of Creating High Performance Companies, uses neuroscience to measure and manage organizational cultures to inspire teamwork and accelerate business outcomes. His 2012 book, The Moral Molecule, The Source of Love and Prosperity, recounted his unlikely discovery of the neurochemical uh, oxytocin as the key driver of trust, love, morality, and, distinguish, uh, and that distinguishes our humanity. So Paul's two decades of research have taken him from the Pentagon to the Fortune 500 uh, company boardrooms to the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. All this in a quest to understand the neuroscience of human connection, human happiness, and effective teamwork. So it is my proud honor to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Zak. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So nice to see you. Full House. What a great idea of a Festival of Excellence. It's just a wonderful uh, thing that you have, and I'm so happy to see all of you here. So here's a question for you. The robots are coming. What are you doing about it? 
I'm not talking about killer robots. I'm talking about automation. Right? Automation is taking over all of our lives. So what do we have to do for work when we can automate many tasks? Well, there are some things that humans do that computers really don't do very well. One is making leaps of creativity, but another is building cultures, right? Uh, aggregating humans into a system of behaviors that can either be effective or ineffective. So I'm very interested in how humans organize themselves. And I spent about 10 years running experiments to see if I can understand what makes effective cultures effective, what makes them perform better. And in doing this work, we learned a lot about human nature. So I'm gonna tell you a little about this and give you a taste of what I think the future of work looks like. So when you begin a big research program like this, the first thing you wanna do is identify the pathways that might change uh, behavior or transform behavior into performance. So I'm not gonna have to do the big uh, mathematical derivation. A couple of my parents in the math department back there can help us with it. Uh, but this basically says there's a couple things that cultures do. So culture is this giant, massive idea, right? How people uh, interact with each other in groups. It's just too big to really get a deep insight into how it's working. So let's see if we can take slices of culture and really understand it. So the work we did in the early 2000s identified interpersonal trust as a key driver of performance. So these equations essentially say that when we trust each other, uh, we reduce the frictions that human beings naturally have when they interact in groups, right? So you're a pretty nice person, I'm a pretty nice person. Sometimes I'm cranky, every once in a while, right? Ask my wife, right? So if we hey, I have frictions occasionally, it doesn't mean if I'm having a bad day or my wife's having a bad day, I want to get divorced. It just means, oh, we have some frictions. Let's just either forget it or, or move on or resolve those frictions. So when trust is high, particularly in, in uh, organizations that are working to achieve high performance, we expect that, but trust is like a lubricant. It reduces those frictions, right? So if I understand that uh, Bob in the front row occasionally has a bad day, I'm okay with that, right? But if I trust him that he's gonna come back and be a good team member later on, I don't have to get so excited about that occasional friction that I have. So, um, this accelerates performance by reducing those catching points that we normally have when we work together. Okay, great. That sounds like a reasonable place to start. So let's take this thin slice on culture called trust and see if we can understand it deeply. So the work we've done identifies trust as a set of behaviors, not as a feeling, right? So if I understand this behavior, I've got to dig in and identify where that behavior comes from. So in doing this work, we literally went around the world to identify how different groups perform, and we wanted to take a mechanistic approach to this. I want to identify the, the mechanisms in the brain that allow me to go, oh, Bob's a high performer, right? I can trust him because he's reliable. He's going to, almost all the time, do what he, he tells me he's going to do. So I want to show you one of those experiments. Um, as we did this work, you know, where do you start from? You start by measuring students. Right? You guys are available, you work for a very low wage, which is awesome, I get a lot of data, but it may not generalize. So we're going to businesses, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, actually doing neuroscience experiments in businesses, and we did this in US and Europe, and then you start to worry, gosh, you know, we have this bias, which is we're studying educated Western individuals. Why does this really generalize? Where can we go that's as far from the Western developed world as possible. And where we went was the island of Papua New Guinea. So Papua New Guinea is a volcanic island north of uh, Australia, which has 800 distinct languages. These are very small communities that live in rainforests that, uh, I mean, there are cities there as well, but most of the, of the uh, people in Papua New Guinea live in the rainforest, and they live without electricity, without running water, without bathrooms, and I spent a week embedded in one of these villages in order to understand if the same mechanisms we found in the Western world applied there. So I want to show you one of these experiments so you can see the kind of things that we've done.
年も争いを続けてきた彼らは、これは日本語の TV、NHK TV、そして日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の日本語の They do the things that normal humans do. They socialize, sometimes they get in fights.、Um, they、uh, are very, very social. And so we came in there, we brought in generators, there's no, run, no electricity, no running water.、Uh, we built a little medical hut. This is in the rainforest, so you can see there's a canopy, because when it rains, it's like machine gun fire, like it hurts, it rains so hard. And we protect the electrical equipment. So we tested uh, uh, around 25 men, and we took blood samples before and after this ritual.、Um, That precedes their work life、uh, when they work for the community. So these men had never been to a doctor or dentist before. So they were fascinated to see their own blood come out in tubes. They've seen blood, of course, but they have never seen blood in tubes. And、uh, they were very excited about helping with this experiment because we're capturing part of their own culture, this indigenous culture that humans have evolved to do over this long period of time. And what did we find? We found that the same mechanisms, which I'll tell you about in a minute, That facilitate trust and cooperative work in the Western world also hold in Papua New Guinea. So, if they hold there, they hold in the Western world, it's very likely they hold everywhere. So, it seems like these are a set of universal mechanisms that the human brain has evolved to have that allow us to work effectively together. So, we are gregariously social creatures. We like being around other people. So, if we look around this room, we have a lot of people who don't know each other, and you all look fairly comfortable. Right? A couple in the back, not so much, you know who you are. But everybody else, like, how do we do this?、Right? How do we figure out that it's safe to be here around a bunch of strangers who might be dangerous?、Right? You never know. We have to have something in our brain that says, this person seems safe, this person doesn't. It doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be good enough. And that's the mechanism we spent time looking at. In particular, it's driven by a brain chemical called oxytocin, which my lab was the first to show facilitated stress,、uh, trust between strangers. So, this chemical is released when I see someone who is either familiar or appears safe or trustworthy. That's interesting, number one. Number two, it motivates me to work on someone else's behalf. Well, that's getting much more interesting. And it does this, the third thing, by increasing our sense of empathy or shared emotion with another person. Wow, doesn't this sound like an effective team molecule? Yeah, right? So, this work, which we did.、Uh, For about 15 years,、um, led to lots of publications and、uh, media attention, all kinds of interesting things. And my lab was big, 35 people, running experiments all the time. And at some point, companies started coming and knocking on the door and saying, Hey, you're supposed to be some expert on trust. We think that trust is important in our organization. Can you tell us how to increase trust? I said, Yeah, I developed this assay. It involves blood draws. I'll take blood from your employees. And the people's faces turn white. And they go, Oh, no, you can't do that. Right? Well, that's not possible. And then you think, okay, if I'm a trust expert and I can't tell General Electric how to increase trust in the organization, what kind of expert am I?、Right? Obviously, I need to find a new job. So, so we said, okay, let's see if we can start doing experiments on organizational trust, not just the one on one trust. How do whole organizations build a culture in which I'm empowered to take risks? And not, have, not get fired if it doesn't work out.、I'm, I have an opportunity to create my own career path. That'd be awesome, right? I'm trusting this employee to find ways to continue to create, create value for our organization. So, as we started doing this work, we actually had companies that let us come in, take blood from their employees, measure brand activity, and measure things like productivity so we could relate these all to each other. And then through this work, I got less stupid, which is always a good thing.、Uh, and we actually had derived some principles that organizations can use and are using now to create high trust cultures. And this is why the robots aren't going to take over, because we can do this and they can't. So let me go through how we build high trust cultures that can perform at the highest levels. And this has been applied、um, from the US military to、uh, very large corporations to startup、uh, companies. Okay, so. Oxytocin、uh, is really well known since the work we started doing in the early 2000s. It's been replicated many, many times, and、uh, it's you know, as close to a, as a fact as you get in science, right? It, it works over and over and over. We know a lot about this molecule, 
and how it works. And the work I've done uh, has been used in, in lots of different organizations. So we'll focus a lot on how we organize the individuals to perform at the highest levels. Okay, so here's the kind of schematic uh, to tell you kind of where we're going. So the research we did in organizations identified eight different foundations for organizational trust. And somehow, magically, those eight components spell out the acronym oxytocin. Wasn't that lucky? Amazing, how did that happen? So if I can measure those eight things, then it tells me where I have leverage points, right? Where I can actually change a culture within an organization to improve organizational trust. We can bind that with purpose, which is why we're doing what we're doing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And this model predicts from the neuroscience that I'm gonna be much more engaged at work and in fact, to get this funny implication from the neuroscience, which is if I'm in a high trust organization and I know where I'm going, I know my purpose, I'm gonna enjoy working. Wait, hold on, who are, who are my economist friends here? Right, work is bad, we know that. We call it, uh, the kids will say work sucks. In, in economics they say work provides disutility. Right, this is a deep assumption in economics. Do you guys know people who work for startups? Do you know people who are doing uh, programming, who are performing, who are doing really fun stuff, who work for free? What about artists who actually are playing in the subway with a, you know, a, a case out to collect coins? They do that because they have to do it because they love this. So this says if you're in a high trust organization, you're around people who are doing super cool stuff that you can depend upon, you gotta enjoy working. So that's a testable implication of this model. We'll see if that's true or not. We can take some shots at our economist friends. <coughs> And this will produce high performance. So now we produce this feedback loop in which I'm around people who uh, I can count on to do the right thing. I know where I'm going. I know why I'm doing it. I'm getting lots of feedback that this is really fun. It could be hard, but it still can be fun. And now that's in the brain, it says, oh, you should do more of this, right? This is actually really valuable to you. So why not try even harder? Let's see if that holds up. So let me go through these components in some detail and then show you some data. Okay, so here's the eight components that spell out oxytocin. Um, as I said, first thing we did was we went to organizations that for some reason, um, maybe I'm a persuasive person, allowed us to come in and actually measure brand activity from their employees. This includes uh, Zappos.com, uh, Herman Miller, Furniture Maker, a number of organizations that let us come in and, and kind of torture their employees to make sure that the principles we found in the laboratory using college students and the principles we found in Papua New Guinea apply to people at work. Because context matters. From the brain perspective, context always matters. So we've got to make sure this really works in context. So once we did that, we developed a survey we call O-Factor that allowed us to do this at scale. So I'm going to show you what these principles are, but also show you data from a national representative sample of US working adults that took this survey so that we could quantify each of these eight oxytocin factors and we didn't have to draw blood from thousands of thousands of people. And uh, because I'm interested in leverage, I, all this sounds good, right? Sounds reasonable, but unless the leverage is sufficiently high, organizations are not gonna implement these kinds of policies. And these are very much pro-employee policies. All these are about empowering individuals to do what they want to do, to be their best selves at work. So if I want to create an employee-centric organization that's going to perform at the highest levels, there's got to be enough leverage so that the organization wants to do this. In other words, the payoff, the profit has to be high enough, right? If it's just like sink money into ping pong tables and free food and, I don't know, Taco Tuesday, it's got to have a payoff, right? If that really works, and usually it doesn't, but if that really works, there's got to be a payoff. So I'm going to talk about leverage of each of these eight components, and you'll see the leverage is actually high for every one of them. Okay, so the first is, uh, uh, the O is in oxytocin is for ovation. So this is recognizing high performers. So uh, the students who are in business school will go, gosh, I think the first week in, I don't know, Management 101, they talked about recognition programs. Right? But this is where the science becomes valuable. Right? So sure, we want to recognize high performers, but the impact on the brain and therefore on behavior will be much higher when that recognition is unexpected, when it's public, when it comes from peers, when it's personal, when it's tangible. Right? So I can optimize 
the way I recognize high performers so that I get the biggest impact on an individual and on a group. So here's how this works, right? So we finished this big three-month project, and uh, Bob, my favorite guy in the front row, uh, Bob is the leader of this team, and they just nailed it. The client's super happy. And so, uh, again, from a neuroscience perspective, within a week of that project finishing, I need to recognize him if I want to enforce the importance of hitting high-performance goals. So our next all-hands meeting on Monday, we have this nice celebration for Bob. We go, oh yeah, Bob was great. He did his thing, the client's super happy, finished the project on time, on budget. Clap for him, hey Bob, how did you do it? So now I get to recognize Bob in front of all his peers. This is a community of individuals who have chosen to work for this organization and now your community says you're awesome. And not only because you finished this project on time, but because you did that by putting an extra effort. So what I want to do is use this ovation also to debrief and share that information with the entire organization. So how did you do it? So I've done hundreds of these uh, ovations, and inevitably the team leader who's being recognized will go, you know, it wasn't just me. Uh, Brian helped me and Susan helped me, and I thought we lost the data, and for two weeks we'd be out of luck, and then uh, Bill told me how to find the backup, and blah, 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 blah. And so then we start recognizing the team, and we begin to discover best practice. Right, so an organization cannot perform at the highest levels unless we continually identify best practice leverage points. Does that make sense? So one way to think about how we should treat people at work is to consider everyone at work a volunteer. Uh, you don't need to work for me. You're not required to work for me, right? You've chosen, I've chosen you and you've chosen me, two-sided matching, but you as an employee have chosen to work here. So if you're a volunteer, if you're volunteering to put your effort and your energy and your emotion and all your passion into helping our organization get better, I should treat you like a volunteer, which means I should thank you when you put extra effort in. And I should say please and thank you if I'm a boss. It's not that hard. You're a volunteer. You can go volunteer somewhere else, right? I'd rather keep you working here if you're a high performer. So number one, I want to recognize you. So one of the companies we work with is the uh, Container Store, and we helped them repurpose Valentine's Day into We Love Our Employees Day. So every Valentine's Day, everyone who works for the Container Store, which is about 1,500 people, get a gift basket with chocolates, with personal care items, with a funny video from the, the founder, CEO, who's the biggest introvert you ever met, and he doesn't like doing videos, but he does it anyway. And he talks about, hey, you guys are on the front line, we need you to be successful, and we're so grateful that you're doing this thing. So if you fly into Dallas Airport, you will pass over the headquarters of the container store, and they have on their roof painted these 15-foot high uh, painted uh, lines that say, we love our employees. Are you excited about working for a container store? Yeah, you're getting a lot of love. You're getting a lot of appreciation, a lot of ovation, right? And guess what? At Container Store, turnover is less than 10% a year in retail. Average in retail for the United States is 66%. People stay there. Are they getting paid more? A little bit, not much, just a little bit more. But they're being appreciated. And if you've been to the, you have a Container Store nearby, someone's been, it's a great experience. So after I spoke in their headquarters, they, you know, they gave me some honorarium and they also gave me a gift certificate for 100 bucks to go to their store. So I go there with my daughter, you know, it was people in the headquarters, and I was on video. And four or five of the employees of this store in Pasadena, California, that I've never been in, came up and hugged me. We saw your talk. Oh, it was so great. We're so excited you're here. This is like, you really love these people. They're like, oh, now I get it. This is a great place to be. So that appreciation from the bosses to the employees transfers right away into customer service. Right? We're in this very happy, caring environment and I'm recognizing you when you do extra work. Okay, oh, and here's the numbers. So this, this is a, a um, for the stats people, that's an R squared. So this is the explained variation between ovation and organizational trust. So if this number were 2%, it means I have very little leverage. I could push a lot on, on ovation and get very little trust out of it and therefore increase performance. So you'll see all these numbers from the national data are all quite high so that I have leverage from all eight of these components. Okay, let's go through a couple more, then we'll look at some data. Okay, 
Member uh, two uh, is expectation. This is designing challenges for individuals. So this uh, photograph is the first time I went tandem skydiving, and I was scared out of my mind. And because I'm a neuroscientist, I took my blood before and after to figure out what the hell happens in your brain when you're scared out of your mind, strapped to another dude at 12,000 feet. And what did I find? I found, and also I had a graduate student come up on the plane to 12,000 feet and give me cognitive tests, which I couldn't do. So I was really freaked out. Because the skydive instructor said, there's three things you have to do to get out of the plane safely. Do this, do this, arch your back. Okay, I don't know what an unsafe exit to that plane is, but I do not want to find out, right? So all I can think about is the three things, the three things, the three things. So this is the way our brain works. When you're under uh, moderate to high levels of stress, you have tunnel vision. You're focused on task. Doing those cognitive tests at 12,000 feet, not important. Watching that door open in the airplane and thinking about getting out safely, very, very important. So when we design challenges for individuals, you give individuals a chance to meet those challenges, to feel great about having accomplished something important, and it draws on brain resources that you don't have when you're under-challenged. So from a leadership perspective, I need to begin to design challenges for individuals and teams so they can stretch. We call these stretch goals. I'm going to stretch hard to meet what I want to do, and I'm not going to be tempted to go on social media, look at Snapchat, talk about my friends, go shopping at work. Like, I got a hard task. This thing is going to be great. I got to be on this thing. And this also causes us to draw on the social resources around us, all right? Organizations are communities of volunteers. And if I get stuck, I need to find out that community of volunteer person who can help me. Oh, remember that uh, ovation with Bill? Oh, yeah, he said, this uh, Bob is the one who can help me if I lose my data. Where's Bob? Oh, my God, I got to talk to Bob because I think I lost my data. Right now, I'm used to using all the resources around me. I'm building those social ties, and that builds trust. Very high relationship between expectation and organizational trust. So challenges are fun. So we can create these challenges so that they're hard. And then what happens when I finish that challenge? Back to step one, ovation, got to celebrate. Hey, that was a tough three months. We really did it. Now let's give you a chance, once I've stressed you, to recover. So just like working out, the brain works the same way. Once you've stressed, like lifting weights or running, you got to have a day of recovery. So if it's a, a big challenge that you've met, um, buy everybody uh, tickets to go skiing the next day on the company, right? Or send them to Disneyland or put them, do something that says, okay, now rest. So the last thing you want to do after you finish a big challenge is the next day start another big challenge. You need time to recover. Go home early, catch up on email, see your family, right? And now maybe the next week hit you harder than another challenge. So it's stress, recover, stress, recover, right? So challenge stress is very engaging, very focusing, and that's the way to reach higher performance. Okay, why is for yield? Uh, yield is... Um, allowing people to execute projects as they see fit. So once you've been trained, I want you to execute so that you have ownership over this project as you see fit. This means, in particular, that you're going to make mistakes. Oh, no. Don't we live in a, in a non-mistake world? Mistakes are bad, right? We can't have mistakes. But there are two kinds of mistakes. Mistakes that deviate from the accepted norm that are worse, and deviations that are positive. We call those innovations. If I want innovation, I've got to yield to letting you execute as you see fit. So in my lab, as you know, we do a lot of blood draws. When I design my lab, I design the blood draw room. And there's a chair, and there's a partition, and there's a centrifuge and a table. And now my lab's really big. And one day I came back from a trip, and they ran some experiments. And the blood draw room was totally changed. Now there's two chairs, there's two partitions, there's a different table. And I'm like, hey, who changed the blood draw room? I go, oh, we realized that we have one phlebotomist, and there was a bottleneck waiting for that person who was getting the blood draw to get out of their chair so the next person could come in, put a tourniquet on, put the alcohol on. So we put in two chairs, and we have a research assistant who preps the person so the phlebotomist can go fast, 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 fast. Awesome. I love this because, number one, they didn't ask me about it. Just do it. If it doesn't work, we can go back to the status quo. They were empowered to make changes, and it worked. It works a lot better, so that's what we do now, right? Don't ask me. Try it, right? If there's a mistake, let's fix that, 
right? Mistake is a learning opportunity. So let's not get too excited about mistakes. From a leadership perspective, the leader's job is risk mitigation. I want, if things are going south, I want to know. So I'm a big believer in the daily huddle. I can do the five-minute stand-up huddle with my team. Check in for five minutes, and it's three questions. What'd you do yesterday? What's your plan today? What do you need help with? Right, so if you're missing milestones, I'm gonna know that every day, right? So if you start really getting off the rails, okay, we're gonna have to refocus what we're doing. But I wanna give you enough leeway so that we find these innovations. During ovations, we spread that information to the whole organization. Hey, we found a better way to do blood draws. When you do your experiment, use this setup. It's much more efficient. Everything will work better. Awesome, it's a learning organization, okay? So again, we don't want to um, punish people for making mistakes. Mistakes are learning opportunities. This is what we tell kids in school, right? Oh, make, mistakes are great. Yeah, you know, you'll learn, you'll get better. But when you're an adult, you don't get to make mistakes anymore. Or, you, or worse, you get yelled at. So um, the brain processes social um, punishment just like physical pain. It's the same network in the brain. So I make a mistake at work. My boss comes in, screams at me. My brain says, that's a painful response. I don't like pain. So am I ever gonna innovate or try something different again? Heck no. But I just create a feedback loop in the brain that says, you do something different, that induces pain, therefore never do it again. Conversely, in the tech industry, particularly in Silicon Valley, they have monthly, congratulations, you screwed up, celebrations. Let's all get pizza and beer, talk about the biggest mistakes we made this month, we'll give an award for the guy who's stupidest and did something dumb. Spread the information, let's not do that again. That didn't work. We tried that for two weeks, total waste of time, right? So we're creating a culture where we want people to innovate. If you want innovation, you've gotta have mistakes and yield is the way to generate mistakes on the positive and negative side. All right. Uh, the T is for transfer. So once I have yielded to um, letting you execute projects as you see fit, the next stage of the evolution, and the order here is not random, of course, the next stage of the evolution of the organization is to allow you to choose what you work on, right? So these are organizations in which you say, not Bob works for accounting and Sue works in a customer service. It's like, oh, hey, we have a new project. We have a new initiative. We have a new store opening. Who would like to do it? Think of the buy-in you get when you create an, an uh, an organization in which you're choosing what projects to work on, and by extension, where to work on and what time. Why is eight to five work hours? I, I have people in my group who are night owls, and they work best from six until three. Why do they need to be sitting next to me? If I trust them, if I challenge them, if they have clear milestones and goals, and you wanna work all night, awesome. As long as your team's making progress, I don't care. You wanna work from the beach in, in uh, the French Riviera? Great, as long as I see you once in a while, maybe all hands meetings, I gotta see you once in a while, I don't care, right? I wanna empower you to do your best. So this picture is uh, one of my uh, uh, former colleagues uh, now passed away at Claremont Gretchen, University, Peter Drucker, one of the two great management gurus of the 20th century, along with uh, Edwards Deming. And tomorrow, I'm speaking at the Deming Conference which is on campus? Aviation. It's in aviation, okay, so the Deming Conference. Uh, there's lots of Deming in the book as well, by the way. Um, Peter Drucker, in the 1960s, right before all of us were born, even me, uh, coined the word knowledge worker. He said, if you're a knowledge worker, you need to be your own CEO. That is, you have such high levels of skills that you can choose the kind of career you want. So my view now is that in 2019, we are all knowledge workers. If you're a janitor, if you're a truck driver, you're using technology, you have skills, and you need to be the master of your career, and you do that effectively in organizations that have transfer. We allow you to do what you really want to do. So you take all your energy and passion and focus that on the thing that really gives you energy and joy and passion at work, as opposed to doing stuff that's less interesting to you. So this is called job crafting. I'm gonna craft a job because you're a high performer on the stuff that you really dig. Give me more of that, I like doing this thing. That stuff, not so much. Maybe occasionally I have to do some of that stuff. There's still work, there's still some disutility, right? But to the extent possible, I wanna get you working on the stuff that just turns you on, 
right? Then you're going to re reach high performance, right? So this requires training, requires lots of feedback, clear milestones, expectations, right? All this has to be in play, and I can empower you to be really successful. For example, there's a software company called Valve. Um, some of you guys may have used some of their online games. And when they hire people, they don't assign you to a group. They give you a desk with wheels, and they tell you to find a working group that looks interesting for you to hang out with. Wow, what kind of place is that to work at? Yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to find some group of people in my organization that seem really interesting to work on. They're working on a project basis. At the end of a project, they do a 360 evaluation. Everyone evaluates each other. If you're in my working group, and you rolled your desk over, and you weren't creating value, eh. So look, you know, Susan showed up, but you know, I don't know, half the time she didn't do much, she was disruptive. I really don't want her back in my working group, right? By the way, Google does the same thing. Uh, the, the average length of time people stay in a team at Google, at Google now is three weeks. They do this on purpose. They want to induce some chaos. They want to do some change because everyone at Google is smart. They're very motivated, and they want to have a clear focus. I know where the goals are, but also get different ideas so that people can reach high performance. Okay. Uh, the O is for openness. So if you are your own CEO, how can you make good decisions that benefit the corporation or the organization unless you know where the organization is going? So something that you already know about these social creatures called humans, we like to talk. And if you don't tell me what we're doing in my organization, we're going to chat. We're going to gossip. Right? Did you hear? Are we getting laid off? Are we getting bought out? Am I losing my job? Right? I don't want you focused on that. I want you focused on high performance. Right? Hard job, doing the best that you can, doing stuff you love doing. It's super cool. We're knocking it out of the park. And now if I think I'm going to get fired or moved or whatever, there's some big change, I'm not going to know. So a number of very innovative organizations practice what's called radical openness, in which the books are open to employees, the emails are public, Salaries are public. Ownership of shares in the company is public. So for example, there's a social media optimization company called Buffer. You can look it up on your phones or computers. And they list every piece of information that's not um, identified with, say, personnel issues. So it has salaries. They have a salary formula. It's absolutely transparent. Right? It says, there's three levels of work. If you live in London or in New York, you get a little bump because it's more expensive. You're in level one, two, or three. And it has people's names listed, CEO, everyone down. Everyone's names are listed with their salary, the shares they own. So now instead of saying, did you hear Bob got a raise? Hey, I got, why, am, I, am I getting a raise? Am I getting fired? Why did Bob get a raise? It's on paper. You want to see what the, what the levels are? Yeah, it's on paper. Right? It takes away all that wasted energy on trying to figure out what the political game is within my organization, just get rid of it all. And, and nowadays, you guys, we all have these things. You think all information does not go out everywhere immediately? Why not? Right? Someone's going to take a picture of that private report. It's going to go somewhere. So companies like Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, they release quarterly profit and loss statements to all employees. They pay them to take classes so they understand what the accounting means so everyone knows what everything is going on in the company. It just reduces that level of concern or lack of trust, right? I have to trust you if I'm showing you what's happening. So at Whole Foods, for example, occasionally they open stores and they have to close them. Well, you know, they actually get profit and loss statements by department. Each department is actually run as a separate unit. The manager at the department decides how to source the food, how to merchandise it, uh, more or less uh, focuses on pricing as well. And if I know the meat department's losing money and I'm working in the, I don't know, produce department, Right, the meat guy's gonna come talk to me. Hey, produce, you guys are making money. What are we doing wrong? Or, you know, give me some tips. And if, and if that whole store's losing money, we're all gonna know it. And eventually, they're like, okay, we're gonna close this, this, this uh, Whole Foods, and we'll try to absorb you guys in, in different uh, stores nearby. But it's, there's no surprise, we know it's coming, which also means you can harness all these brains to help solve the problem. Hey, you know, meat and fish are losing money like crazy but everyone else is doing fine. What's, what's, what's going on with the meat and fish department? You guys, let's have a meeting, let's discuss. What can we do better there so we can keep our jobs? Because we like working here, right? It's kind of nice. Whole Foods, nice place to be. Okay, the C is for caring. So for some reason, in most business schools, I'm sure not here, we are told that there's a work you 
and there's a private you, and never the two shall meet. Right, so at work, very nice, hello, how are you, sir, good. Right, that's not the way our brains work. When we're around other humans, we form social relationships. It's natural, we form friendships. Right, so if I have a work you and a private you, then I have to think about which you am I talking about, and I gotta spend energy doing that, it's too draining, I don't wanna do that, I just wanna be me. Right, so our brains are built to form relationships, we can build relationships even with people across different levels of the organization. Believe me, if you're the boss, people know you write the check. You don't have to lure that over them. So one way to build those relationships is to break down that, that hierarchical structure that we've kind of inherited from the ancient days of uh, you know, manufacturing. Right? So wearing casual clothes, wearing jeans, using first name basis. Right? So uh, going out for beers and pizza once a month after work together. Right? All that building relationships is very valuable because now I know more about you as a person not just as a piece of human capital. So I don't know, the economists can tell me, but I don't know where this word human capital came from. It's horrendous, it's evil. You're not human capital, you're a human being. You're a person, you have feelings, you have emotions, you have good days and bad days. I should recognize you as a human being because you're a volunteer here. I want you to keep coming here. I want you to put in lots of effort here. I should treat you as an individual, not as a replaceable machine. And to do that, I've got to build relationships with you. So here's a simple thing you can do that's really effective. So when we walk in work, we normally say, hi, Bob, how are you? Good, how are you? Uh, right? Instead of just replacing that uh, with the emotion you see in the person's face. Hi, Bob, you look tired, sad, happy, worried. Now we have a whole different kind of conversation. Oh, you know what? I am really tired. I, my kids had the flu for two days. I don't know what's going on with her. And uh, you know, I haven't been sleeping. So if I'm a leader, my response would be, look, do you need to be here? Because I don't think you're working at high, high levels. Why don't you take the day off or take a nap or work half day or whatever you need to do, right? So I'd rather have you take the day off. If your team's working, everything is in progress, we're not having a crisis, I don't really need you here, go home. Work on that issue, come back. So somehow think that what happens in your home life doesn't affect work and vice versa. Of course it affects work, right? We spend a lot of time talking about work. We shouldn't pretend it doesn't. If I'm a smart leader, if I'm a high trust leader, if I'm a high performance leader, I want you to keep coming back. I've got to treat you as a human being. Right? For that, I've got to build a relationship. I've got to know something about you. So concrete example, I have a woman, a PhD uh, from my lab, who's worked for me for 10 years, named Beth. And one day she walked in the lab, and, and you know, this was a graduate student at the time. And I always, for some reason, want them to get married and have babies. I don't know why, but I like babies. I like to hold them. So, Anyway, she walks in, she looks super happy. I'm like, what happened? You fell in love, did you meet a boy? Like, what's going on? You are glowing. And she goes, you know what? I started running about three months ago. I've lost 15 pounds. I'm doing my first 5K or 10K um, in a couple of weeks. I couldn't be happier. I'm like, you just look so happy. She has told me so many times how important it was to her that I recognized that she was having a great day. How hard was that? It was 60 seconds of my life, right? And what did she say later on when she said how important it was to her? She goes, I want to work for you for the rest of my life. Bingo. That's a high-performance employee. Okay, we've got two more. I is for investment. So you may have realized, if you've been following my typology here, that the backward-looking annual review that all employees hate is not useful in this high-trust environment. Why? Because I'm setting challenges for you. I'm giving you feedback. I'm checking in daily in my daily huddle, right? We're working as a team on giving you a chance to grow your career. Looking backwards, right, anything more than a week is just old ancient history to the brain. So if you're following this typology, it means that you can actually begin to use that annual review as a forward-looking, what we call the whole person review. I'm going to sit down with you once a year and talk about growth because growth is very important for humans to feel like they're mastering their lives, right? And that growth is gonna be in three dimensions. We're gonna discuss personal growth, professional growth, and for lack of a better word, spiritual growth. So by personal growth, I mean, how's your family? Is your spouse doing well? How are your kids doing? If, you're, if your wife's not happy or your, or your husband's not happy, you're not gonna be a great performer at work. The last thing I want is someone coming in my office saying, I gotta quit, my wife's gonna leave me unless we move back to Chicago and, and, and I, gotta, I gotta quit this week. Hey, we have an office in Chicago. Or you can work remotely from Chicago. Let's make that happen. 
Give me a couple of weeks, yeah, let's do that. You're a high performer, I wanna keep you in our organization. But the second is professional growth. Where do you wanna be next year? I like asking the provocative question, uh, which is, what do you want your next job to be? Let's talk about that. And maybe that next job is somewhere else. Maybe it's at Google or at Facebook. One of the former students from my lab works for Facebook. I helped her get the job, I made some phone calls, got an interview, it's a like, dream job for her. I'm, I'm super excited because I'm invested in her as a human being, not as a piece of human capital that I can exploit. And guess what? I got a person at Facebook. Right? If I want to do a project at Facebook, I can just make a phone call. And I have made a phone call, and we've done projects with Facebook. How cool is that? Now, if she come, works at Facebook for three years and comes back to work for me, they spent three years training her on stuff that I don't know that she can take back to my lab and teach other people. Win-win. Right? So I want to be invested in her as a human being. And if she wants to go somewhere else, I want to facilitate that. Right? Because I have that relationship with her, and I want her to be successful and happy. Okay, the third, so let's talk about that. Where do you want to be? What training do you need? Do you need more conference attendance? Do you want to go to some special training? Um, I want to make that happen because I'm invested in you. And lastly, what I'm calling spiritual growth. Besides work and family, what really gives you energy? What do you really care about? How do you make the world a better place? Is it rock climbing? Is it volunteering in your kid's school? Let's make sure you have time for that because if one of those three components of your life, personal, professional, spiritual, is not working well, you're not going to be a high performer. Eventually, that's going to drag you down. Right? If it's just work and home and work and home, you don't have time for anything else, for a hobby, for something that really is refreshing to you, you're not going to be successful. So let's just have that discussion up front. Right? Do you have enough time for these other things? Okay. And lastly, uh, natural. So it turns out that we still need leaders. Even though I want to flatten organizations, high trust organizations tend to be fairly flat, less hierarchical. Um, Leaders model the behavior we see. So if I want to create a high trust organization, leaders themselves have to be trustworthy. You've got to be open and honest. You've got to follow through on what you say you do. And you've got to take responsibility for mistakes. Ultimately, leader, leaders are responsible for all mistakes that happen in the organization. And also, you can make it fun. So I put up Southwest, Southwest Airlines here uh, because Herb Kelleher, who just died, started Southwest. He was great at creating a fun environment that has infected all of Southwest. You guys all fly in Southwest. You know how fun it is. He would wear funny hats, he'd hand out drinks, he'd, he, uh, you know, load the luggage, he would talk to customers. He really created a culture in which, hey, we're gonna work hard and we're gonna try to beat up the majors, which they've certainly done, but we're gonna have a fun time doing it. Create this culture where it's not that crazy, right? So if you look at, look at things like job turnover at Southwest, very, very low. People love working there, and that infectious, fun sense transfers over into customer service. So leaders have to walk the walk. Okay, so if we look at these eight components and we compare them to overall organizational trust, we explain 100% of the variation in trust. That is, there's no more set, there's a, not another set of uh, management controllable factors that influence organizational trust. Okay, so that's good news. It means we can play in those eight areas. We have plenty of leverage to improve, improve uh, trust. Now let's relate that to performance. Oh, and this, and this uh, other issue of purpose. So um, the neuroscience says that trust and purpose will, will reinforce each other. So there's two kinds of purpose in organizations. One is the, what I call transactional purpose, how we do business, right? What it takes to bring in revenues, pay expenses. Very, very important to have those procedures in place. There's another form of purpose I call um, transcendent purpose. Why do we exist as an organization? For-profit, non-profit, uh, government. What are we even doing here? So ultimately, according to Deming, the ultimate goal of an organization is to improve people's lives. Right? The only reason SUGU exists is to improve the lives of students. Right? Full stop. The only reason that the government exists is to improve the lives of citizens. The only reason you're paying for some good or service from a company is to because it makes your life better. So you should embrace that sense of purpose. We um, are all in the service business. We are about helping other people achieve their goals, be happier. And when companies embrace that sense of purpose, in experiments we've run in my lab and in cross-country data I'll show you in a second, um, those organizations are much more, more effective. So very briefly, I'll tell you that we've run experiments. We say, uh, here's a simple experiment that you guys will understand. You, we're gonna have you enter emails for alumni so we can hit them up for donations. It's not fun, so we're gonna pay you $15 an hour. Type in the, the uh, emails, right? 
we look at how accurate they are. So we just say, hey, it's for emails, we're raising money at the university. Accuracy is around 75%. That's okay. Now if we say, the reason that we're doing this, we're still going to pay you, is because we have students who are from uh, underprivileged homes, who are from different countries, who are struggling to get an education, and here's one of them, right? This person's name is so-and-so. Here's the picture. The purpose of these donations is not so that the university can have more money, it's so that we can help specific individuals achieve their dreams. Accuracy goes up to almost 100%. The amount of emails uh, entered in a period of time almost doubles when you know the purpose, which is serving others. So organizations need to really embrace this purpose. So again, lots of evidence that, that uh, purpose, uh, which is driven by this need of connection, which is driven by oxytocin, reinforces trust very strongly. Okay, so lots of evidence. This is a work out of the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, shows that the best companies to work for based on surveys are much more profitable, have higher stock valuations. And in survey data we collected uh, two years ago, we looked at individuals who work in the highest quartile of um, uh, companies for trust compared to those in the lowest quartile, and we find that the predictions of the model I showed you, that schematic model, in fact, are supported. We see much less chronic stress in high trust organizations, um, lots more energy at work. People are more productive on self-report. They enjoy their job 60% more. They're 50% more likely to be working at that company 12 months from now. They're much more aligned with the company's purpose. They, of course, have uh, the higher job satisfaction. They're more likely to be innovating. A couple of really nice measures I like. Fewer stick days. That's a nice objective measure, right? If you're in a high-trust organization, why do you have fewer stick days? Well, if you're in a low-trust organization where it's stressing you out, you don't know what's happening, you're, you can't control your life, your immune system may be compromised, or, and you're getting sicker, or you're taking a sick day to look for a new job. Either case, that's a nice piece of evidence that these high trust organizations, people are showing up more and therefore uh, performing better. And they're more satisfied with their lives outside of work. So when you work in a high trust organization, you're a better spouse, you're a better parent, you're a better citizen, you're a better community member, because I'm not beating you up at work every day. Right? You have a chance to actually live a fulfilled life. And by the way, people in high trust organizations compared to low trust organizations make about 30% more salary. So in a competitive world where salaries, companies are competing for employees, the only way I can pay you more is if you're more productive. So what we're leading to is how do we get to that point? Right, I'm going to go through this very briefly, but basically we're going to apply the scientific method to organizing humans. So first identify the problem we have in our organization. Uh, turnover is too high. People are not staying with the job very long. So identify the objective and then get some baseline data. Find out where we are and where we can intervene. So run the trust survey and find out what we want to change. Right? Each of those eight oxytocin factors provides significant leverage on org organizational trust, but they do so at a declining rate. So generally, we recommend organizations push on the lowest of those eight factors. Right? That's the easiest way to uh, increase performance more rapidly. So if uh, expectation is lowest, great. Let's institute a program which involves uh, behavioral change so that expectation is higher and performance is reached. And now be very clear on what you're doing with the people in the organization. We're going to try this for six months, see if it works. Actually, we found, uh, the state is in the book, but we found at Zappos that a three-month intervention significantly improved organizational trust, uh, improved employee performance, multiply measured. So even three months is fast enough to induce a culture change. So we're going to try this for six months. Here's our baseline data. If it works, let's stick with it. It was a great program. If it doesn't, I can go back to the status quo. I can abort. Go, you know what? We tried this program. Didn't seem to improve performance. Did, didn't, say, reduce job turnover or didn't uh, improve our ability to implement projects uh, under, uh, under budget. So we can always go back to the old way we did things. But this is a constant process, right? Measuring the way people interact at work, creating interventions to change the way people interact, and then creating this employee-centric culture where everyone can achieve their highest levels of performance, be recognized for that high discretionary effort, and then really feel great about what you're doing within your organization, but also for your community, right? Creating a lot of value and opportunity for people around you. This is all a social endeavor. 
So here's a couple things you can do if you're in an organization, in a fraternity, in a, a classroom that you can do right away. So first is uh, have people um, you know, talk about how to solve problems together rather than have a boss do it, right? So you can do that easily by, if you're leading an organization, sit in the back of the room in the meeting. You don't have to be in the front. Have someone who's junior to you lead the meeting. Give them a chance to generate a different kind of discussion. Um, second, celebrate victories all the time, right? So recognize people constantly. It could be something as small as a $10 Starbucks card. It could be a thank you. It could be flowers. Anything that says we recognize you worked really hard and we appreciate it. It's really important to social creatures to be recognized by the community. And lastly, in any organization, here's a question we use all the time, which gives you a snapshot of how well the culture is working, which is on a typical day, how much do you enjoy doing this job? One to seven. If you're getting fives and sixes and sevens, awesome. You're doing great. You're getting twos and threes, not so much. And then you've got to think about changing the way people interact with each other so that you induce higher levels of trust, a stronger connection, and higher performance. So uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Um, I think all this works, what I call the triple bottom line. This is great for people in organizations, for employees, for volunteers. It's great for the organization themselves. They perform better, and it strengthens communities. So if we put human beings first, then we can reach both great levels of joy at work and also high performance. So thank you so much for listening. It's been a pleasure.